Hello, my name is Lois Simons, and I'm the owner of Gardening by Nature's Design. Looking forward to showing you this garden today. When we first came here, there was the oak tree and the pistache, and later on you'll see there was a magnolia. These established trees we've kept in the garden, and but the surround is all native uh, plants and native plant communities. We draw from primarily two communities that naturally grow in this area. That's the coastal sage grove and the mixed evergreen forest, as well as the redwood forest. When I first came here, I saw the hillside and the steepness of the slope. And I saw that there was evidence of erosion on both hillsides, this one and the one over here. So I thought to capture the water, as you can see, the slope is very steep coming down the hillside, but going across the hillside, it's relatively moderate, mild slope from zero to 2%. So I realized that I could create wetlands and capture the rainwater, the water from the roof, and bring it into the garden, and therefore increase the flow of water in the garden in a positive way for plants to draw from, and also to not only take care of the function, redirect the water so that it's no longer eroding the hillside, but filtering water into the hillside to feed the plants and allowing the plants to draw from that water for a longer period of time before we have to use irrigation because essentially what we're doing in this type of soil is raising the water table. So in order to do that, I established wetlands and I will show them to you later on. Right now, I'm going to introduce you to some of the native plants and their community. Right here are the native shade plants, the ribes, which is the native current. I'm going to be using a lot of common names as we tour the garden, but there will be available a plant list which lists both scientific and common names in case you want to buy and what the scientific name allows you to buy the right plant. So this is a ribes or a native current and it can grow to about six feet tall. So it'll just come above the window here and it'll fill out on either side of the window. But here is a snowberry and you can see that it has produced lovely snowberries. Another native plant, there is a type of snowberry that also is a ground cover. Just notice the wonderful arching of the snowberry. It's really sweet. This also is an evergreen ribes, another current that doesn't lose its leaves in the winter time and it will flow down this hillside. I think most of you may be familiar with the Douglas iris and all of these plants grow in proximity to one another, bridging uh, the shade and the sun area is an Arctostaphylus, commonly known as a manzanita. It's the sunset Arctostaphylus, and I love this one. It is a shrub tree ground cover because essentially it will grow out kind of in a nice, wonderful circle, and then it'll start to lift up and grow upwards. And so it will frame this window as well. One thing I want to note for you when we do work in shade is we work with texture. Notice the shift in texture from the manzanita to the ribes, to the snowdrop, and the iris. So visually, one plant complements the other and yet creates some points of interest. As we come further into the garden, we then introduce you into the sun area. And this is where we can bring in a lot more color. I have at the base of this very steep slope is a sedge. And it is a wetlands plant. The wonderful thing about wetlands plants is that they love the water in the winter time. They just take it in. And in the summertime, they're drought tolerant. So they're perfect for this type of situation. Also, it makes it really nice because if you have a wetlands, 
It's wet in the winter time, dry in the summer, so it doesn't bring in mosquitoes to the garden. And I must point out that we're doing this tour at a time where the flowering is at its lowest point in the season. This is a penstemon. It's a margarita, B.O.P. Heterophilus. And I just love this flower because it is lilac and purple. And the different shades are just wonderful. It's then complemented by the penstemon etonii, which you can see here is a red bloom. Along here we have a California aster. And over here we have a carex, which is a meadow sedge. And you can hardly notice them, but this is a blue-eyed grass. They're just at a low period right now, and then they'll start blooming once again. In front of the house here, we have plants that will create a diverse hedge. We have the island snapdragon, which you can see also is red and it's blue. And then we have an Arctostaphylis densiflora Howard McMinn. It's a manzanita. It's the rare case of a manzanita that can be used as a shrub because if properly placed and pruned, it will keep its lower leaves. So it will come to about three and a half, four and a half feet. Right alongside it is the coffee berry, Rhamnus californica, Mount Zambruna. This also will come to three and a half, four and a half feet. So as you're sitting here, you'll be able to see over it into the garden, and yet it creates a nice border for the front porch here. The Douglas Iris in the Pacific Coast. And over here in the partial shade, we have some California huckleberries. This is another manzanita. It's the Louis Edmond, and it is actually a shrub tree. So it will grow to about this tall and hide the downspout. So in the middle of this planting bed, we have a vine maple, and I just love the coloration of the bark. And here we have a lavatera. And it is a, a native mallow, and it has this beautiful star lavender flower. Once again, we have the manzanitas and coffee berries, but we also have California red bud. And this will get to be as, as high as we'd like it, and we probably would, are gonna keep it down to six feet. As you can see, it has a beautiful leaf shaped like a heart. And it flowers little droplets of uh, lavender flowers in the springtime. So we have the drain pipe coming down from the roof here and it feeds these ferns along the hillside. The water gets broken up here, stopped by the stone wall and the so capturing it for the ferns that are behind the wall. Same thing happens here. This is the overflow swale from the wetlands and these stone wall also captures and breaks the flow of water down the hillside. Here is a polypody fern and the native strawberries in the uh, overflow swale and just underneath it is a deer fern and of course the giant chain fern. We're on the hillside with the wetlands area and I just want to introduce you some plants uh, below and to note the uh, shift in textural changes in the foliage from the sedge to the penstemon, this other penstemon, the calamagrostis, foliosa, which is reed grass, to the aster, the carex, and the Pacific Coast iris, and the Douglas iris, and the chain fern. So I just wanted to show you how the plants bring your eye up the hillside into the wetlands and beyond, and how the depth of perception that it leads you to. So basically, we're celebrating the hillside, and we're bringing you into an environment so that you shift from your everyday experience into the garden. So over on this hillside, which was getting very eroded because the sump pump 
was releasing its water on this hillside and as you can see it also is very steep slope. So what we did, once again, we put in rock walls to moderate the slope and we transferred the water of the sump pump down into a wetlands. There's sunlight at the very front of the hillside, dappled sunlight and shade throughout because of the pistache tree behind. So what we have here, the golden rod, which will bring in butterflies, the milkweed, which will bring in butterflies as well. Flowing down the hillside is the evergreen current and it will just arch as it grows. Its leaves will become more and more arching so that it will define this hillside and the lovely curve. At this point, I'll simply point out the fescue above the pistache. So the California fescue, this is a, a giant variety and the sage green is quite beautiful and lovely in, in the partial shade. Here we have actually a coyote bush, but it's a ground cover and it's called Pigeon Point. It has a really lovely texture. So my approach to gardening is one that's called permaculture and it's an ecological approach to gardening and it works with the topography of the land, what is. And therefore, we're in harmony with the land and with our environment. And it helps people to engage. What we do in a situation like this, where there's erosion on the hillside, we take that problem and we create a solution. The problem as it presented was the severity of the hillside vertically coming down. And the solution presented itself in the fact that the slope across the hillside was very moderate. So if with great care, I could build wetlands to capture the water. Well, I could build rock stone walls to moderate the actual slope of the hillside. And once again, more effectively capture the water. The other thing that I have going here are the plants. The wetland plants act as a good water capture as well. So right here we have our first wetlands. And as you can see, this hillside is quite steep. So we have to be careful here because we don't want any overflow of the wetlands to come down this hillside. So what we did is we brought the water into the wetlands and captured the water back. But then as it fills, it then is set up to overflow in this direction rather than having it flowing down the hillside we've broken the extreme vertical slope of the hillside to capture that water in the wetlands which in turn raises the water level providing water for plants once they've established so not only do i back these stone walls with the secondary wall but I also, we amend the soil behind, directly behind the wall. And the reason we do that is that clay actually expands six times its size when it is saturated and wet. We don't want that pressure directly on this wall. So we amend it and that alleviates the pressure on the wall as well and it uh, makes them last a lot longer. So here is the dry creek bed, which feeds into the wetlands area. It is all the wetlands, the swales, the dry creek bed, the wetlands, are created to capture the water, but they're not at a 0% slope because then if there was a great deal of rainfall and it was saturated, the water wouldn't, it would become stagnant. So we have it at half percent, one percent slope, so that it is able to fill up and yet drain out very slowly. We slope everything according to where we want the direction of the water to flow. And of course we have our sedges, the carex, the calamagrostis foliosa, and the Berkeley sedge, all at different points on the vertical hillside to capture any overflow of water, just from the general flow of water because of the verticality of the hillside. Because of the fragility of the hillside and the severe verticality, 
towards the steps there. We're being very careful here. So instead of diverting the water from this downpipe into the dry creek bed at the moment, we're simply capturing rainwater. And show you the stone wall here. It's done to look like a natural setting. Ones that I have seen when I've been up in Yosemite. And you can notice how the stones fall and they flow together as if they've fallen into place. You particularly noticeable right over here. It's inspired by Yosemite. It's created to transport you into a natural setting. So you don't have to go all the way to Yosemite. You can enjoy it right here. So whenever you do a design, you want the elements to be complementary and to create a coherent picture. So even though these cobbles are architectural and have a different impact visually, they, the stones that we selected do complement the cobbles. So it's not jarring, but one leads into the other even though they have a different function and different aesthetic or quality to them. So these Howard McMinn uh, manzanitas and the coffee berries and the island snapdragon will grow to about three and a half feet, possibly four feet tall. They will create an edge to the house porch. But also it will create a certain sense of privacy when you're sitting on the porch and yet allow the person who's sitting there to still view the garden. The other thing is, is that it then creates a new introduction to the house where your eye, your vision will be brought to the pillars of the porch and to the windows of the house, which are a really nice feature to really define the house and its style. And once again, it, it, it also increases the, the length of the house then. So I hope you have enjoyed this tour and that you have found it informative. If you have any questions, you can always contact me. Today, we talked about this garden and how I approach gardening and design. I work with the land, the topography. I work with the environment. I hope you've learned today what it is to create California native plant garden where the plants live in community and relationship with one another and there's a dynamic to that relationship. Basically we're creating the conditions for a natural environment to flourish as well as dealing with problems that come up in an environment, but instead of imposing a solution and having that be mechanical or arbitrary, the solution that we find works with the environment. The erosion on this hillside and the solutions to that erosion that are both functional and bring beauty to the garden. And we created the, those solutions in a threefold way with water features such as the wetlands, the swales, and the dry creek beds, as well as the dry laid rock walls, and the wetland plants, and plants that it can absorb the water as it runs down the hillside. So three-pronged attack.